Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching. If you are not subscribed, make sure you subscribe. And I have a guest. Her name is Amaya Allen, and she has spoken about colorism. And colorism has been a very intense topic. Um, I think it's definitely something, especially in our community, that is talked about and should be talked about because there's just so many different angles that you can go with the topic. So, introduction to yourself and let us know about yourself. Go ahead. Great. Well, hi, Internet. My name is Amaya Allen. I'm a recent graduate of Vanderbilt University where I studied law, history, and society, minor in theater. I uh, don't tell my mother. In 2019, I gave a 2018. Oh, wow. In, 20, yeah, in fall 2018, I did a TED Talk um, called 50 Shades of Black My Experiences with Colorism. And since then, I have been an advocate for speaking up about colorism. I've done a bit of research on the effects of colorism, especially as it pertains to black women. And now I live in London, where I am an insurance broker. Nice. So about yes, congratulations yeah. on the job, by the way, if I have not Thank told you, you already. Um, also, Amaya is family. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so, cousins. <laughs> Okay. So, what's your definition of colorism? Because I feel like some people know, some people don't. So, yeah. go ahead. What's your definition? Well, my I don't really have like my own definition. It okay. Was a coin by Mary, or sorry, by Alice Walker, who um, is best known for the color purple. Okay. She was a black womanist scholar, absolute badass, like chef's kiss <laughs> to Alice Walker, and her definition of colorism was. Something, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, the preferential uh, treatment of people from people within their own race due to having more Eurocentric features, mm -hmm. and specifically colorism, the um, lighter features. Right, because I feel like some people, like, they're like, colorism? Okay, like, obviously it has to do with our skin, um, yeah. but don't really know the particular details as to how it affects us and how it affects the world in a way, yeah. too. Um, you want to talk more about the TED Talk and how that went and your experience with that? So basically, I received the opportunity to do the TED Talk and I was like, yeah, of course. And it actually came out of anger towards a um, certain director within our community who is known for not uh, portraying darker people or darker women specifically in the best light. I'm not going to say any names. Okay. Because, you know, yeah. I'm anger after watching um, one of that uh, creator's new shows. Okay. And I was just feeling like very tired of not being represented. And for me, I, I feel like representation is huge. And I think representation is like, of course, colorism affects other things, but representation is like one of those big things where I feel like colorism impacts you the most because it's the most front facing. Mm -hmm. um, so... I applied, I got selected, I created, or created, I did research, wrote the talk, delivered the talk, and it went on YouTube in about January 2019. Wow. I'm like, it's 2022. I guys. know, I know. And since then, like, it's just been a lot of reception from people just talking about their experiences, not only black people, but also people in other communities. And I've had the chance to work with like South Asian communities because colorism is a huge thing there in East Asian communities as well. And nice. like just being able to talk about like how, like how messed up it is essentially. And when I was a senior in college or junior, sorry, when I was a junior in college, but right before the pandemic, yeah, I was doing research on, um, colorism between like 1920 and 1970 because of the pandemic I wasn't able to complete that research unfortunately but I do have some sort of like background knowledge in terms of like how our literal civil rights movement and the Black Panther movement how all of that was affected by colorism and how that all kind of plays into um respectability politics essentially yeah wow yeah when you said, did I answer your yeah, you did. When you said, um, I want to elaborate on the um, the representation in other communities because that's new. Yeah. I've I've personally never really heard other communities really talking about it. So that yeah, yeah that was interesting because I was like, oh well, I didn't even think it was. I know this sounds bad, but I didn't even think it was a issue for any other community. Yeah, well, if you think about it, like 
I want to start with like South Asian community first, just because like it's it's glaringly obvious. Yeah. Like, it's glaringly obvious enough to do, but it's just like it's what I'm calling on. So in like the South Asian community, like they have really big skin bleaching, like skin bleaching ads are really big over there. Okay. And it's almost like the same thing with like black people, where they like give you like skin bleaching creams and stuff like that. And like a certain Indian actress who, again, not naming, I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it. Priyanka Jonas. Okay. Priyanka Jonas. <laughs> she got her start after winning this universe by doing skin bleaching ads. It was like a five part series. Okay. And that's how a lot of like Bollywood actresses get their start doing skin bleaching commercials. And that just tells you how big it is, like in India and other South Asian countries. And then East, in, like, um, in East Asian countries as well, it's like, uh, girls there in those shows like oh i have to apply like sunscreen or like hiding themselves under umbrellas whenever the sun is out so that they don't get darker and with like the rise of k-pop you're seeing um the way yeah. that fans are treating these k-pop idols based on how dark they are they're perceived as like better looking or they're not getting as much hate when they're lighter which is really interesting yeah yeah that's really so interesting. It's definitely something that has like global reach in my opinion yeah no i agree has anybody like came to you and was like oh well i've experienced this yeah on instagram oh instagram wow videos. yeah so uh i want to say july 20 july 2019 mm-hmm. a an instagram page called dark skin woman okay they've reposted mm-hmm. it like three times since then but i mean i once they tagged me so i just like a whole bunch of women like reaching out to me in my dm saying like oh my god like i think the biggest thing was a lot of people, there wasn't, like, a word for it. Mm-hmm. They were like, yeah, I experienced this, but I didn't know that it was normal. I thought it was just something I experienced, which was really interesting because, like, how is this thing so, like, not only within the black community, within, like, multiple different <clears throat> uh, POC communities, mm-hmm. and yet it feels so individualized. Yeah. Oh, and wow. Like, yeah. Yeah. It must so have been I really eye-opening for other people to watch you talk about it. For sure. Yeah. That's and it was just weird because it was like, this is me, like, it started off as a rant. Like, yeah. It started off with me ranting about a certain director. Yeah, that, like, an actual conversation that you start, I mean, you kind of started a bigger conversation than it came to you and was like, oh, well, I've experienced this. Oh, colorism. So, like, okay. yeah, like, have you, like, heard, was it, like, as big before you did the TED Talk? Or do you feel like it's bigger now um, after you did, after you spoke about it? Well, I definitely have had conversations about it in high school. Yeah. So it wasn't, like, new to me. Yeah. But I was, like, probably a little older, but it wasn't new to me. Yeah. Well, also, yeah. we have to talk about the fact that it wasn't new to you because of where you were born and raised, right? Okay. I was born and raised in New York City. I went to middle school and high school in Brooklyn. I'm originally from Queens. So that's the, I grew up, yeah, that's, like, my background. And I mean, we were talking about racism, yes, but when they're not really... A lot of white people around you. It is, yeah. I yeah. feel like I got more exposed to it once I left to go to college, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Like I knew what it was, but like you said, I didn't have a word for it. So it was like, yeah, I know it's there, and I know it's in the like the air, but 15, 16, 17, I just thought of colors in the context of boys. I was like, boys don't like dark skinned women. Yeah, boys suck because of that. Yes, <laughs> that is yes, that is something that I feel like I've heard a lot. Exactly. And it, you know, that's just, that's just, like, that was just me, like, shooting ships, right? And then when I get to college, that's when you're like, oh, no, like, people will literally treat you differently. And, like, it's not just black people who will do it. And then there are other systemic things, like, literally the opportunities that you get are different. And I honestly think that was because, like, I had a friend in college, like, freshman year, and we are not friends anymore. But she was a Haitian woman. She was um, real light skin. She had really, really curly hair. Mm -hmm. And just the way we were treated on campus, despite almost doing everything together, was completely differently. Yeah. Or was, yeah, completely different. And that's when I was like, oh, no, this is deeper than just, like, boys. Yeah, just, yeah. I don't have any, like, personal experiences with colorism that you'd like to share. Or even just, like, Um, your, like, growing up, like, your type of, your perspective. Yeah, I would say my mom's side of the family, they're Panamanian, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So, growing up, as a Hispanic person who doesn't speak Spanish and also looks like me, 
a lot of the time it was like, no, you're not. Mm, okay. And once when I was in college, it was just like, oh, well, like, am I, you're not paying, like, you know what I mean? Like, I tried to join, like, the, um, what is it called, the Latin American organization on campus. Okay. And they basically told me, like, take your, take your black ass to CSA. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was the Caribbean Student Association. Yeah. Wow. And, like, like, I kind of knew that, like, the way that you're perceived as Panamanian, like, because the thing about Panama is very interesting, and I've noticed this since high school. It's, like, based off of how dark or light you are, that depend, that determines whether or not you're Caribbean Panamanian mm-hmm. or if you're Hispanic Panamanian. Okay. And it's, like, this is the same country. It's not... And you see the same thing with Haiti and Dominican Republic, too. Like That's true. Haiti's, Haiti's in the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic is... Um, like considering Spanish, Spanish countries, yeah, it's the same island. Yeah. So like just growing, like having that in the like background was like, oh, this is very interesting. And it's I don't even think it's oh, part of it is a race thing, but it's like it's also kind of not a race thing because it's like if I was lighter skin and had curly hair, I would be right. I, like I would be a Hispanic Panamanian, right? But because I'm not, I'm a Korean Panamanian, or I'm not even Panamanian at all. You know, how do you really talk about it and? Make it a conversation, but not be offensive. Want to hear more about colorism with my dear cousin, Amaya Allen? Stay tuned for part two, Colorism Podcast Edition.